I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to Sweetwater's Guitars and Gear. A special guest is in the studio with us today. Richard Fortas is here. Good to Hi. see you, my friend. Good to see you. Thanks Great. for having me. Absolutely. Great to, uh, to have you here. It's the first time to Sweetwater. It is. First time in Fort Wayne. What would you think? It's an incredible facility. Isn't it something? Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah, you were demonstrating uh, Super Amps at the meeting this morning, yes. right? All right, right. Yeah. How'd that go? Great. Great. Good deal. Good deal. Yeah. Nice auditorium. It's yeah. Really pretty. Sounds incredible in there, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Very nice. Very nice. So you, uh, for most people, probably best known for Guns N' Roses, but you have a really diverse career going. Your whole, uh, everything from uh, uh, Richard Butler, from uh, Psychedelic Furs, to BT, mm -hmm. to Film Scores, to Thin Lizzy, to Dead Daisies. Yeah. I mean, you covered a lot of homework. ground. <laughs> Well, you know, <laughs> try not to be too stupid on these things. <laughs> yeah. I did a lot of hip-hop stuff, too. Um, yeah. yeah. In New York, because I, when I first moved to New York, as I joined the, the Furs, moved to New York from St. Louis, and I was doing all sorts of sessions, and so a lot of, at that time, a lot of hip-hop was coming out. So mm -hmm. all the Puff Day stuff and all his production stuff I did. Right. And uh, worked with, yeah, I worked with everybody in that scene. Right, right. Yeah, it was sort of interesting looking back over your, your discography and, and sort of your history prior to Guns N' Roses. It didn't appear to me anyway that you had done a lot of hard rock or metal stuff. No, I don't know how that happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, you know, I, I really, I came up on the same music that those guys came up. It's just like I sort of went this way and, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, actually, I never owned a Guns N' Roses album before I got the gig, you know. Right. Um, but I came into it through Tommy Stinson, mm -hmm. you know, because I knew him from the Replacements, and uh, actually, you know, Replacements were one of my favorite bands as a kid, you know, growing up. And but before that, prior, when I was younger and my really early formative musical years, I was more of a uh, listening to older music, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, you know, Stones and. Um, Beatles and Kinks and The Who and, you know, that was more where I came from than more the art rock stuff like Genesis and Pink Floyd and um, Soft Machine and bands like that. And then I heard The Clash and everything changed, you know. Right. And so I sort of went that direction. I was really into the whole punk rock and, you know, um, alternative type music. Mm -hmm. And... So I didn't really get in, but I I was a big fan of like the New York Dolls and uh, the Stooges, and so I have that common ground with uh, with Axel and with um, Duff and Slash. I mean, they they all we were all in the same stuff as kids. Sure. So it, it just uh, yeah, it just came about. But I came into it because Robin from Nine Inch Nails was in GNR when I joined. Tommy, mm -hmm. um, Josh Freeze, so uh, all guys that I knew from doing sessions and from, or from diff other bands, you know. Right, right. Yeah. Did you audition for the band or how did you? I did, audition? I auditioned. I was actually on tour in Europe, got the call to audition, so I had three days off, so uh, I was on tour with Enrique Iglesias. Wow. It's a jump from there to Guns N' Roses, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I was just in the middle of this tour, and uh, uh, we did three nights at Albert Hall. This is when he was, Enrique was huge. Right. And I had three days off, so after the last Royal Albert Hall, I had a show. I had a car waiting, went straight to the airport, went to L.A., got off the plane, went straight to do the audition, did the audition, hung out with Axel, for a few hours and is listening to music in his car and talking and then went back to the airport, got back on a plane and flew back to wow. pick up the rest of the tour. Yeah. Wow. So do they, uh, in a situation like that, do they provide you with a list of songs and say, know these or do you just go in and yeah. try and know everything? Yeah. Or? Yeah. They gave me like six songs and said, right. you know, let's, let's do these. So. Yeah. Do you feel uh, compelled in a situation like that to have to play them note for note, or do you say, I'm gonna go in and be myself? And how do you approach an audition like that? Um, that's a good question. I, I always learn it note for note in case they want that, mm -hmm. but then I'm also prepared to do my, my own thing. And right. uh, that way, if you 
start out playing your own thing and they go, uh, that's not really what, and they go, oh, did you want it like this? And then, oh, yeah, okay, that's it. Right, you right. Know? But yeah, it wasn't really like that with GNR. It was more like, you know, no, we want you to do what you do. Mm -hmm. Nice. You know, and sort of fit that into. Right, right. I would bet that kind of harkens to your uh, studio background and experience where you're pretty much working for the, the song that the, uh, right, the right, yeah. with the artist. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yep. So you actually started very early on violin and drums, correct? Yes. Something like age yeah. four? Yeah. When, yeah, did, when did you pick up guitar? Not until, this was about 12 years old. Mm -hmm. I was, there were always guitars around my house because uh, my father was one of the owners of St. Louis Music, so Alvarez and Electra and okay. Ampeg, great. So we always had guitars around the house, uh, but I was always very intimidated because they had six strings and the much longer neck. And <laughs> I, was, and I was fine with four strings and uh, yeah, so I didn't get into it till till later. And I was already playing in bands, playing drums. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I started picking up guitar and messed around with it and I just took to it really quickly. Right, right. Yeah. I saw you're uh, credited with cello on a BT album. Do you still play other oh, yeah, strings? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, that's funny, the B2, BT tour that I did, and I did a bunch of records. We did a lot of stuff together, mm -hmm. actually. He's a really good friend, and uh, man, what a genius that guy is. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, so I would play live with him, too. I, we did a tour together, and I played a lot of electric cello, uh, MIDI pickup, you know, triggering. Uh, I, I still do that, too. I still, yeah. yeah, for scoring and stuff like that all. Mm -hmm. I'll use uh, a cello. Right, right. Another tool in the, uh, in the yeah, tool bag, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I still play violin as well. Wow, that's great. That's great. So who are the eyes? <laughs> the eyes were my very first band when I was, yeah. like, you know, 14, 15, that started working and touring. And um, we actually signed with Atlantic Records and changed their name to Pale Divine because um, there was obviously another band called The Eyes in the right. 60s. Um, and we were a big deal in the Midwest. You know, we would tour all the college towns, you know, it was a mo again, more alternative type sounding band. But yeah, we signed with Atlantic Records and then toured supporting the Psychedelic Furs. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and right. then I ended up joining them. Right, so right, right, nice stuff there. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. And you went on, went on to work with Richard Butler in, in, after that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, I finished off a tour with the Furs, and then we did. Richard called me and said, would you be interested in writing? I'm writing a solo album. Would you be interested in writing with me? Mm -hmm. So I started doing that with him. And then that became Love Spit Love, because we wrote this entire album together. And he's like, man, it wouldn't be right for me to call this a solo album, because Obviously, we did it together, so you know maybe we'll just call it a band and go out and do that. So, and we did two albums together. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, Richard's a great friend of mine and was a huge influence on me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, how did you move from that into doing uh, session work? Well, I was in New York working with him, and I, I was sort of introduced to the whole New York scene with uh, the credibility of being associated with the Furs. And I, I don't know, somehow got a lot of attention quickly and people started hiring me for sessions and and it just snowballed. And I started to the point where I couldn't really afford to tour anymore because mm -hmm. I was doing so much session work. Right. And at that time, there was a lot of session work to be had. Right. <laughs> you know, and in New York, I was doing a lot of TV commercials and film stuff, and as well as albums. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just right. sort of fell into it. And like I said, I did a lot of hip hop stuff. Did you know? It, it was a really cool scene in New York mm -hmm. at that time. For the sessions you were doing, were you called in to provide a particular style, or were you reading down charts, or what kind of uh, things were you doing? Both. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's a very different way of, rec like, I would go do sessions in Nashville. You know, people would, producers would call me like, oh, yeah, he's the guy in New York. You know, like, we got to get, for rock play, we got to get him. And so I'd go down to Nashville, and it was like a completely different world. Mm -hmm. You know, how they approach it, they track everything 
everybody together and it's like okay let's go do it you know like I'm used to coming in afterwards, you know, like the bass and drums and all the roughs are down, and then I would come in and do my thing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it was very experimental, you know, um, combine, you know, what guitar, what amp, and you know, getting the right tone. And Nashville is not like that. It's just plug in and go. You've got your your clean sound. You've got your dirty sound. <laughs> yeah, it's right. like okay, this is it's my tone. Here we go. Right. And New York it wasn't like that. It was always a lot of experimentation, you know, different different amps for whatever was right for the song. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably why I work so much is because I understood, I, I related with producers to where if he referenced, you know, oh, I'm looking for like a Paul Kossoff type vibe in the chorus. I knew, okay, well, I'm going to use a Plexi and I'm going to use a Les Paul. Um, and I had the gear, you know, I amassed a good collection of, of gear. And if you'd say, you know, well, I'm thinking more of like a Paul Weller thing on the, the chorus, you know, I know that he wants a Rickenbacker and a AC30 and, you know. Right. So I think that's why I probably got as much work, because there's a million great players. Sure, you know? sure, sure. Um, but understanding references and being able to speak to uh, producers and knowing my music history and right yeah you know, right yeah. yeah so I think that's how I sort of fell into that yeah yeah interesting you have uh, uh, an interesting dual kind of background there because studying strings one would assume that you're fairly proficient at reading Mm. And you understand some of the classical uh, world and the uh, music theory behind all of that, and yet you have the, the uh, history of the rock kind of things as well. Yeah, I was a rock fanatic. But, you know, the classical thing, I, I actually, my reading is not that great. And unless you do it all the time, like now, I go to read something, like, I'm lost. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, my chops are not there. Uh, but when I was doing it all the time, you know, but right. again, m most of most of the studio stuff was uh, you know charts at best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, chord charts. Uh, yeah, not so much, you know, note reading. Right. Right. But with like film stuff and uh, ads, you know, it was a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So working with, uh, you mentioned you worked a lot with uh, hip hop artists and uh, we talked about BT and uh, on, your, on your, uh, your discography and your resume, I saw everybody from Fiona Apple to Rihanna and, and uh, all people in between. Typically do those people have a, or those artists have a firm idea of what they want you to do or are they saying just go for it? Really depends on the producer. Mm -hmm. you know, it, and that's generally who calls you, you know, is the producer because they have, and it's funny because different producers will hire you for different reasons because of who they think, what they think your thing is. You know, my thing with um, Roy Thomas Baker might be completely different than what my thing is with R RZA, you know? Right. Uh, it, it really just depends on, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, what what is my thing? You know, it right. <laughs> now it's become more of a the rock thing. You know, mm -hmm. but right. it, it's I don't know. It's a strange one that yeah, you know, different producers will some have a very specific idea of what they're looking for or what they're hearing. And other producers, I think the best producers are always the ones that will say, what are you hearing on this? Because a lot of times that's why you want musicians involved because they're going to bring something that you wouldn't hear. Mm -hmm. You know, so as a producer, the ones that say, I want, what are you, what are you thinking? And le that's, you know, a lot of the best ones, that's what they they want. They want that input. They want that creative input to then they can use it. Sure. Um, and then others are, are more specific and they're like, oh, this is what I'm looking for. Or a lot of times producers will ask you first and then say, can, what if we do something like this? Yeah. Right. So. Right. So give them a starting the place and then they can kind of develop it from there and work right, together right. on it. Right. Right. Those are the guys I like working with. Yeah, absolutely.
So I, I'm uh, I'm envious that you got to play with Thin Lizzy. That's that was one of my favorite uh, Dude, favorite bands coming are you up. Guitar yeah. player? Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, for me <laughs> too. I mean, uh, pretty much uh, as far as guitar playing goes, that's like the pinnacle. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. You know, right. Playing <laughs> guitar harmonies with Scott Gorman. Yeah, it's got to be a blast. <laughs> Yeah, Got to be absolutely a blast. Yeah, Scott, um, Gorm was was a, a big influence on me, uh, just as far as my ideals of what the perfect rock guitar tone were. You mm -hmm. know? Um, especially Live and Dangerous, right? You know, him and Robbo, I just had such perfect guitar tones. Yeah. So that was that was a big thrill. It was great to be able to play those songs. It had to be fun. Yeah. 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 I was interested to see with uh, with Dead Daisies that you were the first rock band to go to Cuba after the uh, embargo was lifted. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, tell that's us a little right. bit about that experience. That w it was an amazing experience. Um, we went with uh, well, Daryl Jones was playing bass with us. Um, Bernard Fowler went, and uh, uh, that was the first gigs that we did with John Karabi, and we recorded down there because you don't you don't make money you don't get paid to to play shows down there hmm. so what we did was we we recorded down there and we used their studio the uh you know national studio sure and it they had great gear it was it, it was funky but it was a cool room, and uh, we got a couple of tracks that we did s completely down there and used those on the record. And, um, but, man, the shows were incredible. It was such a, I mean, they were just so passionate about it and so just, it was insane. Nice. It was really great, really nice. great. We had a, a fantastic experience. I think that's probably why I think those guys went back and told the Stones guys, like, you got, we got to do something down there, you know? Right. And it's funny because uh, with GNR, we were talking about trying to figure that out as well. Right. You know, because that would be, you know, the Stones could have gone there at any point because they're Brits. But uh, you know, for GNR, we'd be the first American man to. Right. Right. Yeah, that'd be very that. cool. Yeah, yeah it would be exciting. fun. It'd yeah. be fun. It was a really fantastic experience. Mm -hmm. What a special place. Nice, nice. And and we we also got to work with a lot of Cuban musicians because hmm. it's that cultural exchange thing that you know allows you to get in. And uh, so we had we played with some different Cuban players uh, in the studio, and mm -hmm. uh, it was really great. So what kind of players were coming in? Were they uh, rock players? Were they were playing more the traditional more, music? Yeah, yeah, uh, rock rock players. But they're all they all have that you know, uh, traditional Cuban music under their belts as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, they have their own vibe. It was cool. It was really, we learned a lot from, from doing that. I bet, yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So you were here this morning uh, demonstrating the Supro amps for the sales engineers. I saw you, uh, you were showing the uh, Black Magic and the Supreme 1600. Tell us a little bit about your connection to Supro. Um, well, David Coltai and I, our friends from the Pigtronics days, because I always love the Pigtronics pedals. And when he brought these out, I thought, well, it's great, because I love old Supros. I have a bunch of old Supros myself that mm -hmm. I use. And I was blown away by what he was doing. It was like spot on repros of, because I, I have like an old Thunderbolt and I a b the new one with mine, and it's fantastic, really great amps. And then he came out. I saw at the Nam show. I saw the Black Magic, and played through that, and was like, "Wow, <laughs> this is next level. I got to get one of these." And I was in rehearsals with GNR, and I called him after the show. The next day, it was like Sunday, you know, the end of the last day, and I'm like, dude, I, I got to get that amp. He's like, yeah, 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 I'll send you one. I'm like, no, 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 the one I played today, I, I, I have to have that one. And he's like, uh, well, it's already palletized, but, well, I, I guess I could give you that one. I'm like, okay, 
I'll, I'll be down. <laughs> and so I drove back to Anaheim and and grabbed it from them and uh, started using it in my live setup. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I've been touring with is the Black Magic and then my uh, I have a hundred watt uh, Voodoo head uh, signature head that uh, it, I also use and I hit both amps all night long. Just they're both single channel. Well, actually, that's a dual channel preamp, but I just use it straight in, um, and then I just use my volume for clean and dirty. Right. And I just, I'm blown away by the new Supro stuff. Right. Um, the, the Comet, which just came out, is a fantastic little lamp, and then also the Supreme is a 6v6 version of this that is amazing. Right. Yeah. yeah. They're so so dynamically responsive. Uh, incredibly, yeah. They can really, and they that's really what to I really, like I said, I'm just working my volume knob and how hard you attack the note, you know, that's just... Right. Yeah, it's uh, it's totally my my thing. It's, it's vintage and uh, very organic sounding. Mm -hmm. And it adds that element to the 100 watt, you know, and it's cool. Right, it's nice, cool. I'm nice. really digging my setup this year. Yeah, great, <laughs> great. You were showing some pedals as well, some of the uh, boost pedals. Yeah, the Supro Boost is, we were talking about this earlier, I, I, I love what it does. It just expands the dynamic range of the amp because you can still work your volume knob and you've got that, you've just got a bit more it makes everything bigger, you mm -hmm. know, just sort of opens everything up, that boost pedal. Right. And, yeah, you know, as we were talking about earlier, I'm like, man, every, everybody that buys a Black Magic should buy the boost pedal, too. Put it with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a cool thing. Right, right. Great recommendation. Yeah. Yeah, and they also make the, um, the fuzz pedal, the Supro Fuzz, mm -hmm. which is a great sounding fuzz. And also, the uh, they make an overdrive as well. Mm -hmm. It's more of like a tube screamer type of singy, yeah, sustainy pedal. Not real heavily distorted. It's not real saturated. Yeah, not really heavy, but it's uh, it very smooth sounding overdrive. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. So for someone who's looking to step up and, and get into bigger bands and do bigger tours, uh, obviously you're already experienced with playing bigger shows with Enrique before you join Guns N' Roses, but mm -hmm. those are massive kind of shows. What kind of things do you do to prepare yourself for a tour like that? Um, huh. What do I do to prepare? <laughs> <laughs> or can you prepare for um, that? <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you can't really. You know, I, because you can rehearse forever, but it's a different set of muscles that you use on stage. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's, uh, I guess you've got to get to the point where you don't think about the material. So the more you rehearsed, you know, the, you don't have to really think about that. But then when you get on stage, it's like a whole different thing. So you just have to get out and get, the live shows under your belt, you know, mm -hmm. to uh, to really be before things start really coming together, you know. Right. But yeah, as far as preparing, I mean, I, I do a lot of uh, most of my prep time is with with gear, trying to get nail the sounds that I need to get, you know. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the situation. You know, everything's different. Like with Rihanna touring with Rihanna, it's. There's so much sonic territory to cover, you know, and so it, it's going to be completely different than playing in a rock band where you just hitting your amps and that's it, you know. Right. You know, that's a lot more straightforward than doing a pop tour where, or something like BT, you know, and like making sure all your effects are synced and you know, you're getting clock from the same source and, uh, you know, you can have the uh computer doing your patch changes and things like that you know right which requires a lot of prep time yeah sure sure getting all the gear working yeah. yeah but it's it's a fun challenge you know like uh one year with the psychedelic first i um i covered all the keyboard parts hmm. and uh, with a guitar synth and so a lot of that prep time is trying to figure out okay 
I can use the top two strings and you tune them, you know, because you can tune the synth so that when you hit that high E, it's actually a C, and then you, the, your B string's actually a, an E, and, you know, then I can hit those with a, a string sound, and then my middle two strings are a marimba sound, and then my bottom two strings are pads, you know, for, and tuned differently. So I've been playing with my fingers and hitting all these different parts. And then the chorus is, you know, horns, and it, it was, uh, that was a real challenge. Yeah. But, you know, it's a means to an end. You know, you <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, trying to figure out, okay, well, I have to cover all this stuff. How am I going to do it? Mm hmm Right, right. Yeah. It was, that was a lot of fun, and it was that, that's an extreme example. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. You know, as well as, like, I was playing all the sax solos and things like that <laughs> with guitar synth layered with, guitar and it was it was cool yeah yeah no doubt but you're right that would take a lot of prep to get all that stuff yeah dialed in yeah. and to know the parts so that's that's probably where i spend most of my prep time sure you know right the, the music's the easy part <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome so what's next uh well i mean we just finished the u.s uh stadium leg and now we're going to go to South America. We'll do a couple weeks rehearsal. I'm off for a few weeks. Nice. Um, so I was able to come here, and now I'll go to L.A., do a couple weeks of rehearsal, and then go to South America. And then we break for Christmas, and then we'll go to Asia and Australia, New Zealand. Wow. Yeah. You're covering the world. Yeah, yeah. And then hopefully we'll be back in the U.S. because we didn't hit a lot of markets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we didn't hit Fort Wayne. Gotta come here. <laughs> Gotta come here. <laughs> we can play that room. There you go. <laughs> or the, uh, we have the uh, the outdoor amphitheater now. You can play out there. So. There you go. Cool. <laughs> I don't know if we have enough seats, so I think you might, yeah. I think you might draw a few more than we can, that you uh, can see. Uh, where would they come from? <laughs> <laughs> All over. <laughs> it was great to have you here. Thanks thank for you. taking time thank to chat with much. us. It was a pleasure hearing you play this morning. And oh, uh, you. you're going to do some product videos for us on the, uh, the Supro pro gear and things. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, very cool. Appreciate it very much. Appreciate it. I'm Mitch Gallagher. Thanks for joining me for Sweetwater's Guitars and Gear.